Don't forget to keep money coming forward. The feet of the readers to honor them and to donate to Claire House. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And with our next reading, I was there in the room. Please welcome Grace Henderson. along the edges, saw the yellow, the white liquid, the shit, the clots, pushing harder out of all her holes, pushing harder and harder. I saw through the hole the baby's head, the scratches of black hair, saw it just beyond her bed. As the nurse from the Ukraine kept turning and turning her slippery hand. I was there when each of us, her mother and I, held her leg up and spread her wide, pushing with all her strength against her pushing, and her husband sternly counting, one, two, three, telling her to focus harder. We looked into her then. We couldn't take our eyes away from that place. We forgot the vagina, all of us. What else could explain our lack of awe, our lack of wonder, reverence? I was there when the doctor reached in with Alice in Wonderland spoons, and there as her vagina became a wide operatic mouth, singing with all its strength, first the little head, then the gray flapping arm, then the fast swimming body, swimming quickly into our weeping arms. I was there later, when I just turned and faced her vagina. I stood and let myself see her all spread out, completely exposed, mutilated, swollen and torn, bleeding all over the doctor's hands. He was calmly sewing her up there. I stood, and her vagina suddenly became a wild, pulsing heart. The heart is capable of sacrifice. So is the vagina. The heart is able to forgive and repair. It can change its shape to let us in. It can expand to let us out. So can the vagina. It can ache for us and stretch for us die for us and bleed and bleed us into this wonderful and difficult world. I was there in the room and I remember. Mm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our next reading with Reclaiming Cunt, Sophie Snow. <laughs>
I felt like when my hair was gone down there, that I couldn't help but talk like a little girl, like in this teeny voice, and that was weird. And then the skin would get irritated, and not even calamine lotion would help it. <laughs> she told me that marriage was a compromise. I asked her if shaving my vagina would stop my husband from screwing around. <laughs> <laughs> I asked, well, have you even had many cases like this before? She said that questions diluted the process. <laughs> I needed to jump in. She was sure that it would be a good beginning. So this time, when we got home, he got to shave my vagina. It was like a therapy bonus prize. He clipped it a few times, and there was a little blood in the bathtub. He didn't even notice. He was so happy, shaving me. Then later, <laughs> when, my husband, <laughs> when my husband was pressing against me, I could feel his spiky sharpness sticking into me. My naked, puffy vagina. There was no protection. There was no fluff. And I realized then that hair is there for a reason. It's the leaf around the flower. <laughs> the lawn around the house. You have to love hair to love the vagina. Vagina, she didn't see it over there. <laughs> you can't pick the parts you want. And besides, my husband never stops screwing around on me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, six-year-old girl, Claudia Llewellyn. A six-year-old girl was asked, if your vagina got dressed, what would it wear? Red high tops and a med cap worn backwards. <laughs> If it couldn't speak, what would it say? It would say words that begin with B and T. Turtle and violin are examples. <laughs> what does your vagina remind you of? A pretty dark peach, or a diamond I found from a treasure and it's mine. <laughs> What's special about your vagina? Somewhere deep inside, it has a really, really smart brain. <laughs> what does it smell like? with a woman who loved to make vaginas happy. Oh! Yeah. 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 Thanks, good thing, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Women pay me to dominate them, to excite them, to make them come. I did not start out like this. No, to the contrary, I started out as a lawyer. <laughs> but in my late 30s, I became obsessed with making women happy. It began as a mission of sorts, but then I got involved in it. I got very good at it, kind of brilliant. It was my art. I started getting paid for it. It was as if I had found my calling. I wore outrageous outfits when I dominated women. Lace, silk, leather. And I used props. Whips, handcuffs, robes, dildos. Yes, right. There's nothing like this in tax law. 
<laughs> there were no props, no excitement, and I hated those blue corporate suits. Although I wear them now from time to time in my new line of work, and they serve me quite nicely. Uh, there were no props in corporate law, no wetness, no dark, mysterious foreplay, no erect nipples, no delicious mouths, but mainly there was no moaning. Not the kind I'm talking about anyway. <laughs> this was key. I see now, moaning was the thing that ultimately seduced me and got me addicted to making women happy. When I was a little girl and I would see women in the movies making love, making strange orgasmic noises, I used to laugh. I got strangely hysterical. I couldn't believe that big, outrageous, ungoverned sounds like that came out of women. I longed to moan. I practiced in front of my mirror on the tape recorder, moaning in various keys, various tones. But always when I played it back, it sounded fake. It was fake. It wasn't rooted in anything sexual, really, only in my desire to be sexual. But then, when I was 10, yes, yes, yes. I, I had to pee really bad once on a car trip. I went. It went on for about an hour. And when I finally got to pee in this dirty little gas station, it was so exciting, I moaned. I moaned as I peed. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, me moaning in a Texaco station in the middle of Louisiana. I realized right then that moans are connected with not getting what you want right away, with putting things off. I realized moans were best when they caught you by surprise. They came out of this hidden, mysterious part of you that was speaking its own language. And I realized that moans were, in fact, that language. I became a moaner. <laughs> it made most men anxious. Frankly, it terrified them. I was loud, and they couldn't concentrate on what they were doing. <laughs> they lose focus, then they lose everything. <laughs> we couldn't make love in people's homes. The walls were too thin. I got a reputation in my building, and people stared at me with contempt in the elevator. <laughs> Men thought I was too intense. Some called me insane. I began to feel bad about moaning. I got quiet and polite. I made noise into a pillow. I learned to choke my moan. Hold it back like a <laughs> I began to get headaches and stress-related disorders. I was becoming hopeless when I discovered women. <laughs> I discovered that most women loved my moaning. But more importantly, I discovered how deeply excited I got when other women moaned, when I was responsible for other women moaning. I made love to quiet women and I found this place inside them and they shot themselves in their moaning. I made love to moaners and they found a deeper, more penetrating moan. It was a kind of surgery, a kind of delicate science, finding the tempo, the exact location or home of the moan. <laughs> That's what I called it. <laughs> Sometimes I found it over a woman's jeans. Sometimes I snuck up on it, off the record quietly disarming the surrounding alarms and moving in. Sometimes I used force, but not violent oppressing force, more like dominating. I'm going to take you someplace, don't worry, lay back and enjoy the ride kind of Sometimes it was simply mundane. I found the moon before things even started, while we were eating salad or chicken. <laughs> just casual, just right there with my fingers. Like, here it is, real simple, in the kitchen, all mixed in with the balsamic vinegar. <laughs> Sometimes I use props. I love props. Sometimes I made the woman find her moan right in front of me. I waited, stuck it out until she opened herself. I wasn't fooled by the minor, more obvious moans. No, I pushed her further all the way into her power moan. There's the clit moan. Uh, uh. The vaginal moan. Uh, uh. The combo clit vaginal moan. Uh, uh, uh. There's the almost moan. Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> 
on it moan, yes, oh, God, yes. The elegant moan, ah, ah, ah. The great slick moan, yes, oh, my God. The wasp moan. The Jewish moan, no. No. Oh. Hey. The African American moan. Oh. Shit. The Irish Catholic moan. Oh. Jesus. The Latina moan. I. I see. The baby moan. The doggy moan. <laughs> the uninhibited mil militant bisexual moan. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The machine gun moan. <laughs> the diva moan. <laughs> the college moan. Tears. 
They drip down my cheeks like honeysuckle. So burning deep inside, yes, my sister, and where my life resides. And my breasts, they ache me so bad. Painful, cut up, warm to the touch. My other three babies, they clung to the wall. But the way they need me, the way they want me, feeds my beautiful lie. Because where I reside is in a bad fucking dream. I only see the worst of things. The war in my hood and in this heart almost destroys any good parts. And being attentive, paying attention, is ignorant. And love, that shit is blasphemy. Bloodshed is just fucking business. And my babies, you see them, they don't even matter because everybody gets deep fried and served on a platter. No way out with the show. Does anybody fucking hear me? Where is the way out? Instead, the, the silence, it bounced back through me like when I was a virgin experiencing insertion, thinking you got what it felt like. Ouch! reading unless Kate Cannon wants to read yeah, the flood. Right. Yeah, fuck yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be so empowering, and we have like pussy grabber in chief here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, no important thing now. And then I was like seconds away from Googling how the fuck do you wrote a poetry reading? Because there's a good, and Michelle reached out, and I was like, thank you, Jesus. Uh, and then she knew all these amazingly talented women, and then now I know all these amazingly talented, talented women. Uh, so pumped on Sunday, the readings are so amazing and impassioned, and I guess <laughs> I was leaving here uh, Sunday morning about 5.30 in the morning, very tired, and we have a new piece of wood right on the side that we're renovating, and there was a very large penis drawn and sharpie <laughs> and everything, and I saw it as I was walking past, and I thought, ever since you guys were born, you were so proud of this thing, <laughs> and like, <laughs> to be like just to be born and be like hey this is it and it's god's gift and, and we've all seen some ugly ones and, uh, and then, like, none of them are embarrassed about them at all the first time i felt like i mean what i could imagine i still wouldn't be able to imagine that freedom was the first time i, I heard a reading so the vagina monologues and then i came out of that room and uh and I thought, wow, this must be how they feel every day about it. <laughs> I feel so great about my pussy, and I was like, this must just be how they feel every day. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is a reading that none of the women shows. I always found it very powerful, and I was really hoping that one of these really impressive women who are fantastic performers would read it, um, but no one shows it. And then I kind of still wanted to read it, and I saw the rehearsal, and I was like, fuck no. Uh, you know, like, I want to be a part of it, but like, I don't know if I have the balls. And anyway, I just... Uh, this is my favorite, <laughs> my favorite um, poems from this. Um, I think that it's pretty important. Uh, they said that some of the most important interviews they had were women in their 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, this particular one really just shows... Uh, the loss that you don't realize. So we'll see how it goes.
down there. I haven't talked about down there since 1953. No, it wasn't about Eisenhower. No, no. And I mean, it's a cellar down there. It's very damp, clammy. You don't want to go down there. Trust me, you get sick, suffocating, very nauseating. The smell of the clamminess and the mildew and everything <laughs> smells unbearable. Gets in your clothes. No, there was no accident down there. It didn't blow up or catch on fire or anything. It wasn't so dramatic. I mean, well, never mind. No, never mind. I can't talk to you about this. What's a smart girl like you talking to old ladies about their down there's for? <laughs> we didn't do this kind of thing when I was a girl. What? Jesus, okay. <laughs> there was this boy, Andy Letkoff. He was cute. Well, I thought so. And tall like me, and I really liked him. He asked me out for a date in his car. I can't tell you this. I can't do this. Talk about down there. Just know it's there, like the cellar. <laughs> it rumbles down there sometimes. You can hear the pipes, and things get caught down there, little animals and things. <laughs> and it gets wet, and sometimes people have to come in and plug up the leaks. Otherwise, the door stays closed. You forget about it. I mean, it's part of the house, but you don't see it, see it or think about it. It has to be there, though, because every house needs a cellar. Otherwise, your bedroom would be in the basement. <laughs> oh, Andy, Andy Letkoff, right? He was very good looking. He was a catch. That's what we would say in my day. And he asked me on a date, and we were in his car. It was a white Chevy Bel Air. I remember thinking that my legs were too long for the seat. I had very long legs. They were bumping up against the dashboards, and I could see my big kneecaps when he just kissed me in this surprisingly take you by control in the movies kind of way. And I got excited, so excited. And well, there, there was a flood down there. <laughs> I couldn't control it. It was like this force of passion, this river of life just flooded through me, right through my panties, right on the car seat of his new white Chevy LA. It wasn't pee, okay? <laughs> and it, it wasn't smelly. Well, frankly, I didn't really smell anything at all. But he said, Andy said it smelled like sour milk. And it was standing in his car seat, and I was a stinky, weird girl. He said he wanted to, I said I wanted to explain. His kiss had caught me off guard. And I, I wasn't that kind of a girl. And normally like this. And I tried to wipe up the flood with my dress this new yellow primrose dress, and it looked so ugly with the flood on it. And he drove me home, and he never said another word. And I got out, and I closed the door, and I closed the whole store, locked it, never opened for business again. I dated some after that, but the idea of flooding again made me too nervous. I never got that close again. But I used to have these dreams. <laughs> Crazy dreams. Oh, they're dopey. Why? Burt Reynolds. I don't know why. He never did much for me in life, but in my dreams. It was always Burt and I. Burt and I. Burt and I. We'd go out. Burt and I. It was some restaurant, like the kind you see in Atlantic City, with the big chandeliers and stuff, and thousands of waiters with vests on. Bert and I would laugh, and he'd give me this orchid corsage. I'd pin it to my blazer. We'd laugh. We were always laughing, Bert and I. We'd eat a shrimp cocktail. Huge shrimp. This is a Trump tribute here. Huge shrimp. Fabulous shrimp. We'd laugh more. We were very happy together. Then he'd look into my eyes, he'd pull me in the middle of a restaurant, and just as he was about to kiss me, the room would start to shake. <laughs> pigeons would fly out from under the table. I don't know where the pigeons came from. 
the flood would come straight down and pour there. It would pour out of me, it would pour and pour, there'd be fish inside it, oh. and little boats, and the whole restaurant would fill with water, and Bert would just be standing waist deep looking at me in that disappointed, you've done it again, kind of way. Horrified to watch his friends Dean Martin and alike just spin the glass in their tuxedos and eat me. <laughs> I, I don't have those dreams anymore. Mm. Nonsense, they took away everything connected with down there. Mm. Moved out the uterus, the tubes, the whole works. The doctor thought he was a bit of a comedian. He said, if you don't use it, you lose it. <coughs> Found out it was cancer. Everything had to go. Who needs it anyway? Right? Highly overrated. I've done other things. I love the dog shows. <laughs> and I sell antiques. Well, what would it wear? What would it wear? What, what kind of a question is that? It would wear a big sign. Closed due to flooding. <laughs> <laughs> what would it say? I told you, it's not like that. It's not a person who speaks. It stopped being a thing that talked a very long time ago. It's a place, a place you don't go. It's closed up, it's under the house, it's down there. Are you happy? You, you made me talk. You got it out of me. You got an old lady to talk about her down there. You feel better now? You know, actually you're the first person I ever talked to about this. And I feel a little better.
Thank you. Bonjour. <laughs> Too hard. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> yes, yes. Where's Brian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there. There! <laughs> Thank you. 